know just what to do, yeah, yeah.
Hey there, church. My name is Joel, and I'm part of the team here at Oasis, and I'm glad that you could worship with us today. As always, we are going to spend a few minutes in prayer together, and today we're going to be praying uh, from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God it's a good passage it would be worth putting that passage of scripture to memory. I wanted to focus on that phrase, the sin that clings so closely. John Owen said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's constant in our lives, this pursuit to to give our lives over to more holiness, to more obedience to Jesus. Um, A lot of us sometimes think that there's all these rules in the Bible uh, because God's some eternal killjoy. He doesn't want us to have any fun. But the truth is um, the commands in Scripture are there for our good, for our joy. That's what they're there for because God knows what's best for us. And God knows the way our lives are going to to thrive the most is, is... in accordance with the way that he created the entire universe. So when we live in rhythm with with the way he created things to be, that's when our lives are going to be full of joy and, and full of, of him. And so we ought to be killing sin constantly, constantly seeking to, to give our lives over to him. And yes, there's grace, there's always forgiveness, um, but... This is a gift that God is giving us uh, to show us areas in our life that can be more fully devoted to him. And so um, it's something that we need to learn because in our society, uh, we don't like to be told what to do. Uh, We don't like to be told how to live our lives. So it's something that we need to learn. So a part of that comes in the place of prayer. God, search my heart, know me, show me those areas in my life that need to be given over to you and give me the power by your Holy Spirit to kill sin and and to do the things that I need to do. And and another piece that I don't ever want to forget is is there's nothing in the Christian life that's meant to be done alone. This is a community project. So um, if you know those areas of your life that need to be more fully given over to God, uh, rope in a friend, uh, someone that you're close to, that you trust, that can pray for you, hold you accountable, um, that can encourage you in that fight. Uh, because it's not always going to be easy. It's going to be hard sometimes. But just look at what Jesus did. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame of the cross. Uh, so that's a picture of the way we can throw off the weight of sin. Uh, So let's pray. Let's pray uh, for our own hearts and pray for the hearts of the people in our church family um, to learn what it means to kill sin and to to throw it off. Um, And and that is what is going to lead us more and more into the joy of knowing God. So let's pray. I'm going to pray real quick. Give you guys a few minutes uh, to pray uh, silently uh, by yourself or with those around you. And then Nate is going to close us in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you as always for your word and that, and that it is so good and that it helps to transform us into the people um, of, of holiness and righteousness um, that you are calling us to be. Uh, and I pray that uh, you would use your word by the power of your Holy Spirit um, to help us to help us to constantly be killing sin, constantly be giving over the areas of our lives where we're weak and we need help, giving that area over to you and relying on you and your Holy Spirit for strength. And I pray that this is something that we would do as a church community, that we would confess our sins to one another, that we encourage one another, challenge one another, hold one another accountable. We would be open and vulnerable with one another. And and all those things um, that as we seek to do your will, that by your grace, You would help us. You would give us the strength and the holiness um, 
to follow your way uh, more closely. And as we do that, would we see your face more clearly and know you more deeply, um, and we would be used and sent out uh, from that place to serve a hurt and broken world. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. God Almighty, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this time of prayer. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for receiving our worship. We pray that it was sweet, um, that it was uh, pleasing to you. God, we pray now that as we turn to your word, that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts to receive the seed of truth that you desire to be planted in our hearts and begin to take root and produce fruit in our lives. So God, just speak to us now. Remove anything that would keep us from hearing you today. Whatever time of day we're watching this, morning, noon, or night, God, I pray that you would meet with us and speak to us through your word. We love you and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Welcome back. This is, this is the end. This is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, coming to a close. Last week, we turned the page. We got into the last chapter. This is the longest series that we've ever done here at Oasis in our seven-year history. Um, so it's been, it's been great. It's been a great journey. And as we turn the page into Matthew 28, Joel taught last week, and he kind of did a capstone uh, look at the... Gospel of Matthew and how the mega themes kind of all come together in the resurrection of Jesus. Did an awesome job. and I would encourage you to go back and listen to those words, receive them. Um, they're on our YouTube channel. You can go check it out from last week. Um, so good. And uh, go check it out. But today we're going to look at the end of Matthew 28. We're going to look at kind of those, those final words of Jesus. And the Gospels, the accounts, all kind of finish and wrap things up a little bit differently. And so I just want to talk about those for a minute, and then we'll go into what Matthew says and how he finishes it up and what, what clicks with him and why he puts his words or, or these words from Jesus into his Gospel account. And so Mark, in chapter 16, it, uh, it talks about these words that Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. And miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Cast out demons, speak new languages, handle snakes, drink anything poisonous, and it won't hurt them. <laughs> what a crazy side effect, right? Of believing and following Jesus. And place hands on the sick and being healed. So good. And then he's taken up into heaven and he, he's put in a place of honor at the right hand of God. That's Mark. Luke in chapter 24 
These are the words that he captures and that he puts into print from Jesus. There is forgiveness of sins for those who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. Stay here and I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Then they go off to Bethany and he blesses them and he's taken up into heaven and they worship him and they return to Jerusalem filled with great joy and they spend their time in the temple praising God. That's Luke. John is out to prove a point. John is out to prove that he was risen by talking about all the people that he appeared to after his resurrection. And there's no real pointing to parting words or the last words of Jesus before he ascends. And he doesn't even really mention the ascension. He leaves it up to Acts as they turn the page from John into Acts. He leaves it to Acts to cover those final words. And in Acts it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And then he was taken up into a cloud and ascends. And then these two white men, right, show up out of nowhere and the disciples are kind of looking up into the air and worshiping and they say, why are you staring up into heaven? Someday he's going to return just as you saw him go. These are last words. Last words hold some weight, don't they? Like when somebody is about to leave on a long trip, we choose very carefully the words we say to them or the words we receive from them we hold on to. Those are important words. Or if someone is on their deathbed and they, they, they just have enough breath to say one last thing, these parting words, they hold some weight don't they? Um, my family had a, had a family friend many years ago. Um, he was near and dear to our hearts. His name was Gene, and Gene was just one of those guys that you couldn't help but like. And he, he loved my wife's singing and boasted about her cooking. Um, he loved my three boys. He used to buy popsicles, and there were some flavors that he didn't really like. Banana was one of those, and my kids like banana. And so he would cart all those popsicles over to our place and they would enjoy those popsicles. He was just one of those guys, just so nice. And he loved Jesus. Um, so much so that uh, there was a time where I had a Jeep Wrangler and I blew the engine. I was going up a hill and the engine just blew up. It was nuts. And so I ordered a new engine and I needed a car to drive around, and wouldn't you know it, Gene steps in and lets me borrow his 1980 Corvette Stingray that has those pipes that go down the side, like the cool years of the Corvette, the Stingray with those big honking pipes on each side, right underneath the doors. The thing was awesome. And it took me a month a month to change out that engine um, and he let me borrow it he let me I took my kids to school in this Corvette it was so much fun he was just so incredibly generous but he also had a breathing problem um, his lungs weren't working very properly and he was on oxygen uh, much of his life and uh, he went to the hospital often and I would go and visit him and on one particular day it was later in the evening and there was some urgency they wanted me to come and see him so I was like okay so I went into the hospital and I visited with him and um, it was kind of seemed normal from other visits that I had had with Gene um, but as I was leaving um, he said hey come here before you go and, I, and so I went over and he said, you take care of those boys and that beautiful wife of yours. I was like, yeah, I got him, Gene. And, and I went to turn and he grabbed my hand and he says, no, I'm serious. Take care of those boys and that wife. And I said, oh, I got you, Gene. And I said, I got, I got it. No worries. I'll take care of them. 
And so I went and I turned and I was going out the door. And, and just as I was going out the door, he yells one more time. And he couldn't breathe real hard, but he, he mustered it up. And he's like, hey, hey. And I turned around and he says, I mean it. And then he says, I'll see you later. And little did I know in that moment, I said, yep, I'll see you later, Gene. Little did I know that um, he was going to pass that night. And his I'll see you later meant I'll see you in heaven. Those were his parting words. And I'll, I'll never forget those words. I'll never forget that time with Gene. And that's what we have here in Matthew. Matthew has recorded these final words that hit him before Jesus was taken up into heaven. And these words have some weight. And, and these words have so much weight that after this series, like next week when we come back, we're going to launch into a new series. We're going to start a new series. And it's going to be all focused on these words to go and make disciples. Make disciples. We're going to focus in on these words from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. So let's, let's go ahead and read those, and then we'll talk about them for a bit. So Matthew 28, starting in verse 16, reading for, through verse 20, it says this, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Which is crazy to me, right? They've been with Jesus all this time. They've seen all of these miracles. They've witnessed his crucifixion. Now they see him raised, alive, standing in front of them, and they still doubted. And, and even so, Jesus says to them, he comes to them and, and tells his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, throughout this whole series, as we've read these scriptures and as we've talked about these, these truths in the Gospel of Matthew, our hope and our prayer is that we would gain a new perspective, that we would see through a different lens, because to our fault, we read scripture and we process scripture through the Western lens of culture. And that's how we see it, and that's how we process it, and that's how we, we do what we do. We, we just look at it through the lens of culture as Westerners. And, and it's like we're looking through the wrong lens. Like, have you ever gotten a pair of binoculars, and I, I've seen kids do this, and they think it's cool, and I, I honestly, I, think, I still think it's cool. Get a pair of binoculars and look in the wrong end. You stick the big end in your eyes and you look around and things that are right in front of you look like they're so, so far away. Like you can look across the room and it looks like it's 100 yards, 200 yards away and you are, are squinting to see things. Even the, even the big things you're squinting to see because they look so small and so far away. And I wonder if that's what we do with Scripture and with God. That we're looking through the wrong lens. That, that we see ourselves as the main character in our story. And that God is someone that we're trying to fit into our story. Like sometimes, not all the time, we want him to fit in our story. So we make a place for him on Sunday. We make a place for them uh, when we pray around the table before dinner. We make a place for them. Sometimes we want him to fit into our story or we want him to fit into our story, um, but we don't want him to give him the main role. We're the main character and God plays a role in our lives. And that's the message of everything in culture today, that this world Everything in it revolves around you, it revolves around me. You do you. It's all about you. It's all about me, that we are the center of our world. And everyone else, including God, is a character in our story. 
And I wonder if this is why so many Christians have, have become complacent, so many Christians have become frustrated or even bored, because if the story is about me, what awe is there? I'm blah, like God is wow, and I'm like, eh. I get bored, so bored. <laughs> See, we, we look for God when we need him, and then we expect him to be like, wow, or be so grateful when we serve him. God is not a part of our story. That's the wrong lens. God is not a part of our story. We are invited into his story. It's all about him. It's all about him. But the problem we have is this lens. We interpret the truth of the Bible through this Western culture. And we use this Western culture to define terms like discipleship, which we're going to dig into in this next series. We use culture to define that word and define that term. And our hope is that through this series and through this next series, a shift will begin to take place in your life. That you'll begin to look through the correct lens that the story is not about you. It's God's story and it's all about his glory. It's all about his glory. Everything we do should point to him and make his glory known. There's been a, a shift in the church culture over the last couple of years and, and specifically in the um, the Wesleyan denomination. There's been a shift in this, this great commission that we're going to focus on over the next few weeks has kind of taken center focus. And I, th there's probably a few reasons. Some of that could be frustration just with the impact the church is having on culture. Um, one of those frustrations could be seeing people make decisions to follow Jesus, but then there's little to no fruit in their lives. And as we see here, Jesus didn't call his disciples to go out and lead people to make a decision to follow me. He said, go and make disciples. And I'm not knocking evangelism. Evangelism is important, but we've, we've cut it short by just saying a prayer, just raising a hand, by just signing a paper. And here's your insurance policy that's going to get you out of hell and help you enter or get you into Heaven, it's this insurance policy. So we end up with people who look exactly the same as culture, except they've added church on Sunday morning. We see people uh, with little or no evidence of serving this king of kings. There, there's no fruit in their lives. And, the, and then this, this one kills me. We've ended up with people who, or churches that are full of, or churches that have many People who are dangerously certain of everlasting life. Dangerously certain that they're going to enter into heaven. You see, if we reduce being a Christian to making a decision about just getting this insurance policy or saying a prayer or doing some of what the Bible teaches, then there's going to be problems within the church. There's not going to be fruit and then what do we do with words like when Jesus says, repent and turn? Like when we make a decision, it's dying to self. It's entering into God's story, making everything about him, repenting and turning from this lifestyle into this new life. It's a turn. It's a shift. And so many times we just lead people into a prayer and there's no turn. There's no shift. And what about this, these words from Jesus? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Maybe there's many people who have called and said, Lord, Lord. They've said the prayer. They've signed the paper. They've raised their hand. That was me. I'm going to tell that story in a little bit. I raised the hand and I signed the paper and I, I went forward and I said the prayer over and over because I wanted that policy. But this is a sobering truth. Not everyone who says that, not everyone who does that will enter the kingdom of God, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
And we've talked about seeds. We've talked about the, the different seeds falling on different grounds. The, the, the word of God, the truth of God, things that he wants to teach us falling on different ground. And some of it falls on ground where it, it grows quickly and then it withers and dies and there's no fruit. Like what do we do with some of those words? When we think about what the church has become and the kind of followers, the kind of Christians that we're becoming. That's why Paul talks about obedience that comes from having faith. See, if you have authentic faith, it will show itself in a life that is moving in a new direction, has a new trajectory. Calvin put it, puts it this way, we are justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. Faith without works is dead, right? We are justified by faith alone. Nothing that we do. And it's not by works so that no one can boast. It's by faith alone. But faith that justifies is never alone. There is obedience. There is fruit that comes from a faith that is alive, that is authentic. Luther puts it another way. Faith is like a tree that is bursting with fruit. If it does not bear fruit, it is not the tree of faith. Hmm. So, so good. So back to that lens. We've reduced the fruit in our lives to what the culture says is fruit. So let me just ask you the question today. What would you consider to be fruit in your life? Like if you, I'm not even talking about scripture right now. I'm just saying like, what would you say today if you were to look at your day today, if you were look at the, to look at your past week, what would you define as fruit in your life? What would you say is fruit? Would you say good kids, um, a healthy bank account, providing for yourself and family, being a good person, not doing bad things, being healthy, having a job, being able to travel, having a house? What's the fruit in your life? Having everything that you ever wanted. Is that the fruit? Um, checking everything off your bucket list. Is that the fruit? Authentic faith bears the fruit of obedience. Obedience to God's word. Do you have faith that moves you towards obedience, which then produces fruit? So what do we do with this passage from Matthew? These closing words, this great commission to go and make disciples, go produce fruit. That is a Bible's definition of fruit, disciples. Teach them all that I have taught you. Be disciples of Jesus and then go teach others. Produce fruit. Baptize them. Produce fruit. Over the next few weeks, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about being disciples, and we're going to talk about making disciples. What is a disciple? What's a disciple maker? How do you disciple someone? Why is it important? And so much more. We're just going to dig right in. But I alluded to, and I want to talk about just my personal story with this idea of obedience and faith and fruit. Um, I asked Jesus to be a part of my life when I was six years old. Christmas Eve around the, the Advent wreath at our table with my, with my family, and I, I said the prayer, and I got down in front of the Christmas tree, and we laid out um, a blanket, and we had communion there, and it was a, a really special moment, and I had those moments continually. Like, I said that prayer and did that thing, raised my hand and signed the paper continuously throughout my teenage years. Every time we went to a youth retreat, every opportunity there was, my hand would go up and I would go down front. My hand would go up and I would sign the paper that I have said the prayer every time, every eye closed, every whatever, head bowed. If you want to ask Jesus to be a part of your life and call on him as Lord, Lord, I would do it because I wanted that insurance policy. 
I didn't have that assurance, and there certainly was not any fruit. The faith in my life was not producing any kind of fruit. And then in my college years, there was a shift. Um, there was a repentance. There was a turning from a life that was producing no fruit, a life that was not obeying God's word. There was a turn in my life of a repentance, and I turned and I started heading in a new tra trajectory. I began obeying what the Bible says. I began listening to what God wanted for my life, and guess what? There began to be fruit being produced in my life. I didn't keep saying that prayer. I made the turn. I had that assurance. And I want to wrap up today the what now with, with just some questions. There's not going to be a whole lot of answers. There's just going to be some questions. One of those questions is about the fruit in your life. The fruit that you have defined as fruit. That fruit, does it point to you or does it point to God? Does it point to the work that you're doing or does it point to the work that God is doing in you and through you? Just yes, just today, I'm, I'm taping this message on Saturday and just today I was at a soccer game and quite often I will have the opportunity to talk to individuals about nutrition and talk to people about weightlifting and there was a, a teenage boy that was sitting on the bench and I was being a ball boy for a soccer game. Carson, my son's soccer game. I was being ball boy and I was on the bench side doing my job, running the sidelines, getting the balls to where they needed to be. And one of the boys, uh, I was, I said something about Carson and he's like, were well, you Carson's dad? And I said, yeah. He's like, you're huge. And in that moment, uh, I had an opportunity. I can point to Everything that I've been doing, I can point to uh, glorify myself or I can say, man, it's a gift from God and it's good genes and I can just point to a creator. Um, I mean, it was, it was just as I was thinking about this message, I, I just thought about that opportunity to point to God's glory and, and not my own. And it was a really cool thing to be able to just talk to this kid in a very uh, God-honoring kind of way. It was, it was fun. So the fruit in your life, does it point to you or does it point to God? Who gets the glory? Are you obeying Scripture? That's what we would define as fruit. Are you obeying Scripture? What place does the Great Commission have in your life? When you think about being a disciple and making disciples, what place does the Great Commission have in your life? And what about this one? Do you have assurance of everlasting life? I'm not talking about just an insurance policy. Do you have assurance? Like, do you have authentic faith that is marked by obedience and fruit that points to God's glory? Do you have that assurance? If not, I want to encourage you to make a turn. I want to encourage you to repent of the life that you've been living and turn and move in a direction towards, move in a trajectory towards God and may everything in your life point to him and make him known. It's all about his glory, his story. The story is not about you. It's about him and his glory. So do you have that assurance? Do you have that authentic faith marked by obedience and fruit that points to God's glory? If not, I would encourage you to reach out to us or I would encourage you to just stop where you are and just pray and, and repent of the life that you've been living and turn and move towards obedience and move towards a life that is producing fruit through faith, authentic faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This has been an awesome journey. Thanks for being with us. I want to encourage you to just tune in next week as we dig into this discipleship series. It's, it's going to be really, 
really exciting. And I, I just hope that through this series, God does in your life what he has done in mine and that you will experience in your life what I have experienced in mine and so many others here at Oasis. So awesome spending time with you. Let me pray for you and then we'll go. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for Matthew's account. And God, we thank you for this great commission, these kind of final words that you left with Matthew. God, I pray that as we dig into these words in this next series, that we would be excited and that we would trust your words and that we would obey them. We love you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Children, the children, the children.